Well, thank you very much. Everybody enjoying their lunch? Good. Well, I am one to improv, and last night, you probably all saw your handy dandy USA Todays in the lobby. So as I was reading this last night, we all still like print of some form, right? I thought this would be a perfect segue to open our session. Pinterest and Instagram used doubles in three years. So I'm going to give you a few clips from the USA Today. The art of conversation isn't dead. It's just moving online. This is a quote from a lady. She says, between me and my friends and coworkers, it's a conversation that goes on throughout the day. It's just how we communicate. They're talking about instant messaging. Young adults are especially message happy, blah, blah, blah. But this is the point. Actual face-to-face -face time is very important. Instant messages are one of the main ways we communicate, she says, with friends, but they can't take the place of a conversation. Even, which is my favorite, with emojis or whatever my kids, emoticons or whatever everybody uses, a text just cannot convey real emotion. See, we talked about social media and all that, and I said in the earlier session, social media is wonderful. We, I see it out there, I'm gonna tweet some stuff out later, I use a lot of things, but social media without the human touch is just posting things online. So oftentimes I get, so you're saying the Dale Carnegie old school way of communicating is where it's at. And I say that's very important. In both my books I talk the personal touch is key. Or you speak at social media conferences. You don't care about the personal touch. You, 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 you think Twitter and LinkedIn and all these things are the be all end all. And the answer is, I think they're both important. But they're centered on one thing. Us, the human being. Agree? And as we open, before I show you a slide, who here may think this is the best device ever created? And who here thinks this might be the worst device ever created? As you walk through the airports and people are, 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 are standing and pulling around, you, you know, looking down. And, and I encourage, I have a column I do with print and promo that says, leaders look up. So let's get into the um, session a little bit for your lunch. You know, when I wrote this first book, uh, Everyone's in Sales, everybody has this view of salespeople, whatever your title is, that is not what this session's about. Sales is a way of communications. If you're in accounting, you're in sales. If you're in manufacturing, you're in sales. And people say, well, no, I'm not. Well, if you're trying to close the accounting books and you're trying to chase down customers or people to turn things in internally, you doggone well better think you're trying to sell to get it done. If you go to your kid's school and they say, so-and-so, Johnny has a problem with listening, and you say, no, 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 you don't understand. He just gets distracted real easy. you got to understand, you're selling. And then they say, well, if that's your definition of sales, and that is my definition of sales. And people say, well, if it's communications, then I'm okay with it. So we are not talking about name repetition. Ryan, it is awesome you're here in Charlotte, Ryan. And Ryan, we can't wait for that session later. I got it. People like their name. Or body mirroring. I had a gentleman a few years ago when I owned a printing company. He's a friend of mine. I told him this later, but he had gone to all these seminars and learned the art of body mirroring. And, he, and I don't know that he knew he was consciously trying this out, but every time I turned around, he would be, I would be in the hallway and I'd be like, and all of a sudden he'd be like, and then I'd, I'd kind of stand like this and he'd kind of He'd kind of stand on this, and you could kind of have a whole dance, you know, you could have a whole dance routine around it. And I told him later, I said, man, I think, I think the idea is to relate to the human being, not to copy them. Or the power handshake. You know, I had tennis wrist or elbow and wrist issues about 10 years ago when I used to actually get a chance to play. And I'd have the guy that learned the death grip handshake is a sign to show you can sell and you're in charge. Run! I'm like, oh, God! You know, and, and my point is, again, another gimmicky thing, or the wink, if you think back to Seinfeld, if you're old enough to remember, you know, the sales guy's like, Ryan, that's not what we're talking about. So everything what I'm trying to set the stage of today, sales is a genuine experience. Somebody asked me in one of the college classes I teach the other night, someone asked me the same question when I was interviewing for a uh, company, I help a lot with printing and promo companies around the country, for a salesperson, am I being too annoying? And I said, you were persistent, but you weren't a pest. Big difference in the two. So everybody, does every, I know you're eating lunch, so even if you can't do it, just try Does anybody have anything to write on in front of them or no? No? All right, 
If you don't, pretend this way. Let me ask you a question. If you're just signing your name, just pretend with me for a second. You're signing your name, you know, hey, here's your dinner check. Is that hard to do? Nope. Now, if you were to do the same thing under it with your opposite hand, visualize with me. Is that harder to do? Now, when you were doing this exercise, you would find you did sign your name the second time. Is that comfortable to you? Would you get better at it over time if you practiced it? Would it ever be probably as comfortable? So the idea is adapting our style of communications in an authentic way to understand others better. So think about it. If I'm right-handed, which I am, I'm going to reach in and shake your hand. But if I'm trying to shake your hand left-handed, as I said earlier this morning, I'm going to be like, do I step with my left? Wait. Wait. It's just not as comfortable. And the whole idea is not think about how you prefer to communicate, how you prefer to sell. Think about how others prefer to communicate. Not in a gimmicky way. So who has the, heard the expression, you know, I'm drowned, I'm slamming, I'm, I'm slammed, I'm buried, I'm coming up for air, I'm in the weeds, I'm covered up, this week is crazy. How many of us say that? I try not to say it when I've written it in a book or say it in a speech, but that is what people feel. How about this? Does anybody feel good doing this? I feel good doing this, so I'm going to do it anyway. <sighs> right? What do you think your customers want? Are they not being asked to do 100 things? Are you not being asked to do 100 things? Are you not being pulled in a million directions between your family and your, and your job and your responsibilities? And yet we walk in the door with one more idea, with one more spiel that, that sounds like this. You know, we're a full-blown integrated marketing communications company offering creative solutions that will be turnkey from the front to the back to fulfillment. And you're like, what? what? Because people aren't bringing that home and can't explain what that means. So people need stress relief. People need their problems solved. People need headache relief. That's what we need. They want us to make their life easier. They want to provide creative solutions. But most importantly, they want to do business with people they trust. Wow, that sounds kind of revolutionary, Ryan. You're the only person on the planet that thought of it. Would you refer your dentist to a close friend if they were terrible? Would you refer a person who painted your house and did a bad job to your neighbor? You can do an okay job or a good job. People might not give you a referral. I gave a, I gave a talk this morning, and I have a couple magazines I own in Atlanta, and I had a lady email me the other day about a vet who had bought a practice of an existing vet. And she was not just a client. She was a raving fan ambassador of this vet. She said, she, you've got to do a story on her. And I'm like, Wow. And sure enough, I called the lady, and she said, I bought the practice. Things had declined a little bit in the last few years. I'm trying to take the best of what was and my new spin on it. And I said, you realize you don't just have a good client or customer? You have a raving fan. She has gone out of her way. She says, well, I had no idea she was reaching out on my behalf. That's what we want. That's, that, you see, there's a difference. Somebody can say, I could do a survey for your company. And they say, yeah, you're doing a good job. Watch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like my youngest daughter. I have three daughters, so you got to feel. Yeah, dad, I'm. Well, that to me, I'm like, what does that mean? It sounds like something's not completely right there. No, it's it's it's, it's good. Well, it's like, it, it 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 it's good. Good and great are two different things. And let me show you something real quick. Everybody can do this. Stretch your arm up for me. Take a break from here. Just put your right arm up or whatever. Okay, stretch it. Now, really stretch it up. That was what I want us to focus on today. Good and great. So that's what we're going to be going through a little bit as you eat your lunch. Um, everyone's in sales. I built this upon a pact, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. We talk about B2B. We talk about B2C, uh, marketing and sales, and all those are very important. But I actually started saying, what about H to H? What about human to human? Behind every Twitter account, behind every LinkedIn page, behind every Pinterest account, behind every Instagram account, behind every Google Plus account, there's a person. And yet, that's hard to remember sometimes, right? Because it's online. The whole secret is no secret. It's, it's blending the two worlds together. It's integrating our communications so that we realize what's online, there's human beings. And human beings need to be understood. You know, Covey argued, Stephen Covey argued, uh, seek first to understand, then to be understood. How good does it feel when someone truly 
without any motive, just listens fully to what we have to say. This isn't my idea, folks. This is biblical concepts from the beginning of time. What I'm saying is, if someone's really saying, well, how's your family? How are you doing with that? How are things going? You feel great. I feel great. But when somebody's talking to you and you're saying something like, you feel like they're not really listening, and yet we're all clamoring for airtime. It's probably the only time I can get airtime when I don't get interrupted. <laughs> but, 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 but in all seriousness, we're all trying to get our message in in a world that never stops. Who agrees our world never stops? Remember 9-11? After 9-11, I should say, when sc- that is when all the scrolling across the TVs began. Go back in time and think about it. This stuff I think about. That didn't begin until right after 9-11. Now it's the norm. You can't go to the gas station without noise in your ear. Put in out attack. I'm like, shut that thing off. The problem is people are bombarded with noise, making our message more and more difficult to get out. I showed a video earlier today, and it said, a colleague of mine says, we have the attention span of a goldfish. I don't know where he did the research. He said it was solid. I don't know. But that, that's where we are. Um, to me, it is the best time in the history to be in communications, to be in sales, and be in marketing. A lot of people would say, no one responds to my email. No one calls me back. No one wants to buy what we have. They're buying from somebody. The choice is, are they buying from you? All of this in my new book, at the end, I came up and I said, a pact is what ties two human beings together. And if you look it up, it's a formal agreement between people. And to me, the four criteria to answer would you buy from you or everyone's in sales or whatever we're speaking of are four ingredients. Passion, authenticity, creativity, and trust. How passionate are you about what you have to say and do? What excitement exudes from you? Do people say, I don't know what I'm signing up for, but I'm pumped. I used to work with my dad in a printing company years ago, and he'd be like, Ryan, you get the salespeople so excited about coming to work here, I don't even know if they know what they're signing up for. So I had to kind of talk to selling them out of starting for us. But I get excited. Authentic. Authentic in leadership. I'm working on my doctorate in organizational leadership. You've probably heard of servant leadership. It's one of the newer leaderships. Authentic leadership is, is on the cutting edge. And what that means, some people debate it's not a type of leadership. I like to say it is. But that's trying to be the same in all circumstances. People in the back saw me and said, you're not going to eat lunch? I said, I will spill it on myself. Because I will. <laughs> but that's not a secret. I mean, I said earlier, I'm the same guy at Home Depot, Walmart, that buys all that gimmicky stuff in the checkout aisle. So what? Be who you are. And the whole idea of this is the only difference in what we're selling, what we're marketing, what we're communicating. We say the same words, the same things. is us. And I want you to know, I'm going to say it over and over, the biggest difference, if you don't embrace it, is no one can compete with you. Because only you can be you. Only I can be me. And my wife would say, thank goodness. (laughs) And everything's built on trust, just as we said earlier. Trust, trust, trust. And you know that's true. Trust takes forever to build, can take a long time to build, it can be destroyed in an instant. And if you don't believe that, it doesn't take long to Google some of the recent developments, I won't name them, but look across the internet at some of the things that have happened in the last couple months, and look at people we thought were a person or whatever, and then things come out. And now, everything happens like that. Bad stuff travels quick, good stuff travels, but not quite as quick. Now, I want you to take a little look at this quadrant. If you've never seen uh, Covey's model, and what I want you to really look at is the uh, top left quadrant. And the top left quadrant is something we've got to think about, about our sales and our marketing and our daily activities. These are things, if you look at the top left, that are important and urgent. These are crises. In printing, graphics, visual communications, we have a lot of these things. And you've got to uh, deal with them. So I don't have a solution for you. I don't have a solution for me. You just get, you got to deal with it. Go down one and look at things to the far left, things that are not important, but things that are urgent. You know, these could be urgent to somebody else. You know, you come into this company picnic or you're doing this or whatever, you got to respond by today, whatever people want to talk to you about. They may be urgent to somebody because they need to check it off their list, but they're not that important to you. They're not on your most important things of the week list, okay? So go down to the bottom right quadrant. These are complete time wasters, not important and not urgent. I mentioned in my earlier session, I had had a number of things coming up in these next few weeks, and I don't know if you've ever had one of the weeks, but again, in being authentic, I realized my mind was all over the place. I was thinking of all this stuff, and I couldn't get any of them done. 
And so I started looking up, I'm a sports fan for Atlanta. Are the Hawks going to be better than the Cavs? Oh, when's Chipper Jones going into the Hall of Fame? I'm looking up this random stuff. Two hours go by. I mean, I don't have one, I don't have five minutes to waste. I'm in the, I'm slammed, I'm buried. And yet my wife's like, what are you doing? She said, you're better just to go play golf. She was asking me. I'm like, oh yeah, that's true. I probably should go do that. My point is when you get into stuff or trivia or conversations that go way too long, we need to get rid of those. So here's what I want us to focus on, the top right quadrant. Things that are important, but they're not urgent. You know, you could have chosen, I guess, to not be here. You could have chosen to skip lunch. You could have chosen not to go to an educational track. Are those important? Yes. Are they going to be the end of you if you don't do it? Probably not. If you don't prospect in sales, is, is it going to catch up with you next week? Probably not. Will it catch up with you? Yep. It's just when. If you don't take care of yourself and get exercise and whatever, is it going to catch up with you if you don't exercise tomorrow? Probably not. Next week? Probably not. Will it catch up to you? Yes. So everything that's planning and setting goals and getting ahead and looking at things, what I call our start doing list, you need to look at, and a stop doing list are in that top right quadrant. What things should go on your start doing list? Like pronto, top three things. What things need to go on your stop doing list? I like lists. I have about 100 things on my list. I'll be glad to show you. Some of them are ridiculous. It could say, plan for the lunch for fast signs. Well, I could probably check that off. <laughs> my, point, my point is, that's not, uh, you know, they're all of a priority difference. No human being can master more than about two or three concepts at a time. So look at this, look at quadrant two activities, and don't look at it just because, well, I don't have to make the prospecting calls today. I don't have to set my goals today. I don't have to meet with my team today and communicate our vision. Because I can do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. I'll do it, I'll do it, I'll do it. Well, it never happens. And you see, and you know what I'm talking about. So let me ask you a few questions. Are you doing things the right way? Just think of it individually, in any part of your life. Are you doing them the best way? Are you doing them for the right reasons? Again, come back to that start doing and stop doing list. If you really ask yourself, there's things that I'm doing right now that I'm, I'm going, man, there's a better way to do this. I've got to maximize my time. So, for example, I have three daughters. They all play traveling soccer. My middle daughter happens to be up in Charlotte today playing soccer. Lucky me, so I can go see games later today. Seriously. But when we took her to this new club on the other side of Atlanta, I don't know what city you're in, Atlanta's a traffic nightmare. We can't just leave her there, even though she's 13 and the middle child, and go home and come back. We have to stay. So I said, you know what? There's a Panera Bread right around there. And I'll go get all my articles I need to write or whatever. And I'll use that hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes to get stuff done if I couldn't get it done during the day when I go. Instead of looking at it as, ugh, which was my natural reaction, oh my goodness. I started going, actually, this is like kind of a break. I can get stuff done that maybe I didn't get done. So I challenge you to think about things like that. Are you doing things for the right reasons? What's your reason behind what you do? What's your reason behind your actions? So again, as I said earlier, someone will get the work. Will it be you? Why or why not? Now, I want to show you something, uh, a way to look at that. And if you look at this quadrant that's up on the screens, in the blue quadrant, we have things that are known to self and things that are known to others. Now, I'm wearing a blue sports coat, okay? whoop de doo you know, pu that's public information. If you look in the yellow quadrant, things that are not known to others, but they are known to self or known to me. If I said I have a fractured right ankle and I didn't tell you, that would be private. I don't, fortunately. But, but, but I that would be private. So we're, we're not focused on that. If we went to the bottom right quadrant, we said things that are not known to others and they're not known to us. Will fast signs meet at this hotel again in the next 20 years? I mean, maybe that's planned out, but for the most part, I don't know. That's not, you know. What I want to focus on is the top right quadrant. What's not known to self, but what is known to others. I used to say in a lot of speeches, beware the blind spot, the top right red one. We all have blind spots. The question is not, as human beings, we have to be continual learners. I screw up every minute, but I have to learn from that screw up and get better and not just say, well, that's just the way it is. I guess I just have to live with it. I don't believe in that. So if you look at that and you're not a blind spot person, you say, well, Ryan, you don't understand. I don't want people to know that I'm grumpy in the morning at work. I'm like, they already know. <laughs> it's okay. I mean, what about if you're just so much, well, in this, this session, everybody knows that stuff. There's, no, there's nothing I don't know. 
You know, visualize yourself backing out of a driveway and your neighbors are all sitting in a cul-de-sac. I live in a cul-de-sac. And if I'm that guy that will not hear the blind spot, puts my arms up like, how dare you tell me even constructively that I'm not perfect, which is the way to improve in life. And you're backing your car up and they're watching you and you slowly are backing and you veer into the mailbox. And they're like, you get up, bam, slam the door. And they're like, did anybody see I was going to hit that mailbox? Like, uh, yeah, actually, everybody saw it. And like, why didn't you tell me? Did you really want to know? And a lot of people say, well, I mean, really? You know, you didn't want to know because you're always right. And what I'm saying is, it's not going around going, I'm a loser. Tell me everything I'm doing wrong. That's not what I'm saying. Embrace the blind spot to see ways to communicate better, to sell better, to learn more, to market better, and to get your message across in this world that moves so quickly is so noisy is so connected how do you do that well one thing i recommend is get 360 degree feedback if you don't know what that is that's getting feedback in the corporate set cor corporate world would be people above you people that are your peers people that work for you but i'd even go a step further from your neighbor from a friend somebody at your church from somebody that you see uh you know at the, at the ball field uh, someone at a civic club. So you get 360 degree feedback, you start getting a pretty good feel for the what, what people take away, right? So then what do you do? Is anybody familiar with the term called SMART goals? Okay, so let me ask you this question. If you're going to set goals, so we now we know our blind spot, we want to get better in sales, we want to grow, we, we want to intersect sales and marketing, which I'm going to tie together at the end. So we got to set goals. So let me ask you this question. A SMART goal is this a smart goal? We want to, I want to grow my sales. Is that a smart goal? Just take a stab. No, that's right. Smart goal has to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. And, and what that means is I want to grow, assuming 10% is the number and it's, it's realistic for your business. I want to grow my sales in calendar year 2016, 10% over calendar year 2015. Is that a SMART goal? Calendar year, specific, is measurable. Attainable would be, is 10% good? Can it be 20%? I don't know that math. Uh, is it relevant? Sure, we all want to grow. Is it time sensitive? Can you measure it? And then you make SMART goals once you understand your blind spot, and you say, and, and you go, Ryan, I've created these SMART goals. I am going to sell more, and I've got goals set. I'm like, awesome. So what are you going to do to sell more? What are your action steps? Ooh, you didn't mention action steps. So the action steps then become the daily, hourly things we do that make up our goals. And by the way, based on spending a lot of time in the learning environment, don't try to pick more than about two or three things that you can focus on on goals. If you, if you can take out three ideas out of this lunch session and implement those, that's awesome. Two is great. But when people go, I got like nine ideas, this used to be me, and I'd get to about one of them and the rest would sit in a pile, of things that I mean, want to put on my to-do list to go back and review, fast signs, lunch notes that just sat there. So pick the most important things that, that you feel apply to you. So in my new book, I started talking about nine C's of effective sales. I think it apply to all of us. Again, everyone's in sales. We're all communicating a message, whatever our title is. And the first one is credible. How credible, credible are we in what we say? And that's like the word truth. You know, is what we're saying, do people believe what we're saying? If you refer someone to me, and I know you, and you say you should talk to so-and-so, I will take the call because of what? I believe that you, you know, you're somebody I respect, and you're credible to me, so I'll take the phone call. Are you consistent? And I put the note online and offline. What is online? All the world that we have here that's online. What's offline? Everything's been traditional. If our actions online and offline don't match up, we come across as a fraud. When I write, when I'm teaching college classes, I have a little saying to each of my classes I've ever taught, keep pushing forward, KPF. And to them, I'm like, you know what, guys, I don't care at the end of the day, these are guys going back to get their bachelor's degree, working adults, maybe they never finished it or got an AA. I'm like, you're here, everybody's telling you it's a waste of time, keep pushing forward, you're doing the right thing, keep working at it, don't give up, keep going the extra mile, step by step, day by day, inch by inch, mile by mile. And I said, so they, they would come up at the end and say, you don't understand what that meant. But I was consistent what I said to them. I meant it. I would say it in other parts of my life. 
And people, clients over the years have said, Ryan, you're too encouraging. Is that a, what? So you're too encouraging to us salespeople. I'm like, is that a bad thing? She goes, no, no, you come down on us hard. But you do it nicely. What? She's, you know, and she told me, she's like, well, we used to have everybody to jerk and they slam their fist on the table and so we've got to meet these numbers. I said, but isn't there a way to make you want to buy in more and go, go through the fence like a great football coach? Consistent. Compelling. What do we do that's ir- irresistible? What's our message? How do we, you know, how do, we, how do we stand out in a compelling manner? That's what gets attention. That's what's on the front of the, the USA Today uh, top five stories, things you need to know because somehow they broke through all the noise of all the stories to become compelling. Concise. Why do I put 140 characters? That's the Twitter world. You don't fit it in 140 characters, you better learn to abbreviate or use shortcuts. Uh, Instagram's the same way. I don't really use Instagram that much personally. I did one for Fast Signs last night, but I only follow four people, my wife, my three daughters, simply because I need to see what they're writing. That's it. And a lot of their friends follow me. I don't follow kids back, ever, because I, you know, that becomes an area, you know, they can follow and see what I write, but I don't do that. And in Twitter, I just want to point out why I'm talking to this, kids and ki- are younger and younger are getting on Twitter. So if you have a Twitter account, you got to be careful. You start seeing people that are 12, 13, 14 with Twitter accounts. Now, when I quickly go through, I've got 22,000, 21, 22,000 Twitter followers and a bunch of people will follow stuff and I'll, I'll follow them back. And then I got to look at carefully. I'm like, what does that say? Looking to be a high school sophomore with dreams? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just got to really pay attention and, and see what you're doing and, and be concise. So coming back to concise, we have only so many sound bites. We live in a sound bite world. You know, it's the headline. Um, LeBron James, he was interviewed last week about giving, I think, 1,000 kids scholarships in Akron, Ohio. The headline at the very end of a five-minute article, back up one second, Michael Jordan had a basketball game a couple weeks ago, and he said in a hypothetical, in my prime, I would have beaten LeBron James if we were both in our prime. The very end of the interview with LeBron James, they said, one more question. If you versus Michael in your prime, who would win? He's like, man, me. He said, but we'd be going out in wheelchairs and ambulances. The headline in the USA Today, probably while I was wasting time one day, said... LeBron James would beat Jordan, he says. Nothing about the thousand college scholarships. Except I clicked on it. I mean, I went into the story. But you see, concise, everything's a news bite. Committed. How committed are you? If you remember the World Cup, not the Women's World Cup, which was awesome this year, the one from a year ago, I believe it was Adidas, I think, and they had a commercial I loved. It said, All in or nothing. Hashtag, all in or nothing. That's it. You gotta be fully 100% engaged in sales. You gotta be able to look at yourself and say, man, I pulled out everything. I was credible, I was consistent, I was creative in my approach. I left nothing that I didn't ask people for their advice or ways to do it better, and I didn't get the job. That's okay. It's when you look at yourself and say, man, I should've done that, ugh, I forgot. Man, I didn't even think about that. That's where we gotta be learners and look at that blind spot. Uh, how caring are we? You know, we hear this, we hear an uh, expression oftentimes in uh, sales says always be closing, ABCs. Mine is always be caring. People can tell if you're caring. If you care about them first, all the rest of the stuff I told you falls into place, but it has to be genuine. Content. We hear content is king. One of, one of my friends written a book, uh, The Content Code, and he did a lot of research on this, and he said that content, which is the great information we put out and we tweet about and we put out on LinkedIn and we put out, you know, whatever we bring, articles or whatever. I brought you content today with this US Today article. Used to say, if you put out enough content, you're going to be at the top of the pile. And the argument now is that's just to get you in the game. Everybody's curating content, which is pulling information in, or they're creating new content themselves. So consider content and information you're bringing very important in sales. Character. Your character says everything and clarity. Keep it simple, stupid. Be very clear in what you say, especially online. And remember, like I said here, emojis or all this stuff, they don't get the job done. Just putting an LOL. If I said, I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be here. Well, I mean, if I wrote that in text, does my, my oldest daughter writes, can you do this, please? There's just nothing but tone, and she always wants to text. Yet I tell you, she's 16 and my 13-year-old will call and she'll, she'll do both. 
Um, so I'm going, wait a second, we can't just dump all younger people into a, bu- a bucket. And then again, I know people in their 60s and 70s, whatever, they embrace social media. And people are like, well, wait a second, I thought all those people would just read the newspaper and all the young people, they don't talk. Research has tendencies, but it is also we're human beings. So let me show you a couple other things. In our sales competence, the first level is we're unconsciously incompetent. What does that mean? We're not that good and we're not aware we're that good in sales. The second stage as we grow, we're aware, but we're still not that good. Think about when you're driving a car. First stage, you don't, you don't know you're that bad a driver and you're a bad driver until you get a fender bender or a ticket and then you, your parents, if you go back in time, say, you're not going to be driving at all if you do that again. So now you move to stage two, you're not good still, but you're aware you're not good. Stage three is not all bad. I like stage three a lot. You're aware and you're pretty good. Because in stage three for me is you're a continual learner. You're not the person in this lunch going, eh, he's not said anything. I've heard all this stuff before. I've heard it a million times. This is the biggest waste of time. I mean, anybody could get up there and say that. Not me. I would say there's always something to learn. Because stage four, the only fear with stage four is like us driving a car. We're unconsciously competent. I drove from Atlanta up here. And guys, I didn't think about put key in, turn ignition right, put in drive, emergency brake pull. I just did it. You're driving 80 miles an hour, got your hand on the wheel, and you're not even thinking about it. And that's all good and well, but you don't want to get into a lazy man syndrome where this is how I've always done it. That's how I've always done it. You know, I'm from the South. I can get my That's how we've always done it here. I don't like all that so Insta, Twitter, man, Twitter, whatever it is. I, I don't get on any of that stuff, Ryan. I'm like, okay, dude, can you, we're not, you don't have to do the accent. Come on. So we, 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 have, we have two options. We can either be moving forward or going backwards. There is no such thing as staying the same. There's no such thing as staying the same. Where are you in your sales? Where will you be a year from now? So look at our time. You know, I like to say, you cannot say you didn't have time. We hear this all the time. Ryan, I've been slammed. I didn't have time. You didn't make time, right? I have 168 hours in the week, 24 times 7. You have 168 hours in the week, 24 times 7. You might work at a company that has 500 people, I might work at a company that has two people. You have more headaches, you have more manpower. I have less headaches, I have less manpower. It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter how rich you are, where you live, how poor you are, male, female, doesn't matter. We all have 168 hours a week, in, in the week. So in our world, we have a total inundation of multimedia every day. And I'm not going to cover that anymore because I've already touched on it. That's what I think of time as, total inundation multimedia every day. Our message must stand out. So we all have a brand. The choice is not if you have one, but what you do with your brand. Brand is built upon trust. Everybody take their pen or something, not a knife, because I don't want anybody to stab each other. Just take something above your head, pointing at the ceiling above you. I want to show you something. Okay. And please don't stab anybody, because I don't want to, I don't want to, everybody should know clockwise in this room. The younger the audience gets, they don't know what clockwise means, so it's not going to work much longer. All right, so taking your pen, watching your own pen or whatever, clockwise painting straight at the ceiling, start bringing it down, still going clockwise straight at the ceiling, bringing it down to eye level, still pointing it up straight at the ceiling, keep bringing it down, you start looking down at your pen, still pointing up straight at the ceiling, start looking down at your pen, still pointing up straight at the ceiling, still pointing straight at the ceiling, and which way does your pen appear to be going? What changed? Perception. Perception. So that's the whole idea of our brand. It doesn't matter if you're a one-person company or a hundred-person company. And everybody's still doing that afterwards. Just don't beat the knife and all. They're like, Zorro, I have guys doing that with me. So well, I want to point that out. Here's my definition of your brand in sales. It's the baseline measurement, if you will, of your reputation, your attributes, your name, and your distinctiveness. And, let, and I think that makes sense. But if I said to you, I'm up in Charlotte, and I said, hey, uh, my friend John Smith lives in Charlotte. And you said, yeah, uh-huh, I know. You don't say anything bad. And I said, or I said, my friend John Smith lives in Charlotte. Like, Man, that guy's awesome. He, uh, matter of fact, he mowed our yard the entire summer. My dad hurt his back. The first person said nothing negative about John Smith. But if you're paying attention, he told you a little bit or a lot. In this industry, a lot of times I'll get asked, Ryan, do you know so-and-so? And I'm like, uh-huh. They're like, isn't he awesome? I'm like, huh? Yeah, yeah. They go, great. I'll tell them we were talking. I'm like, sure, be sure to do that. So, you know, think about your brand, think about your distinctiveness, think about your name, and what does your name mean? And, and that should mean something. Um, 
It's tied together with the intersection of sales and marketing. All right, so the intersection of sales and marketing, in my new book, I said, you're going to find a street called Brand. For too long, tracks in every conference I speak at or have gone to say, what, sales and marketing. Well, first of all, sales and marketing are, are, are two different things. I mean, sales is out front line. Marketing traditionally has been setting the plan. I've done both my whole career. Marketing setting the game plan. It says, why can't sales guys sell? We give them all the materials. We give them, we got everything there. They can't execute anything. And salespeople say, they don't get it. They're not doing what I do. They don't understand to be have doors shut in their face and the competition and the pricing pressures. Well, I argue that we're at an intersection of the two. Everything's changed. So traditionally, sales is the exchange of product and services for money, traditional definition. Marketing is the action business of promoting and selling products and services, blah, blah, blah. A friend of mine, Jay Baer, who wrote a, a testimony in the back of my newest book, he's, he's got one of the top marketing blogs in the world, he said, and I like this quote, he said, the art of aligning what you want people to think about you or your company versus what people actually do think about your company and vice versa. And Jay said it real well. Um, he, he was spot on. So we've got to align those two. So do you have satisfied customers or raving fans? Are you seeing this as value or are you seeing this as a cost? Uh, solutions partner is value, tra transactional vendor is price. Um, you've got to consider this when we're, when we're selling. Value is equal to the price plus whatever services or offerings we have plus you. Without you, you're just a price or a service or offering. Only you can be you, as I said earlier. People can copy this presentation. People can copy whatever. They copy stuff all the time. But they cannot replicate my DNA. They cannot replicate my fingerprint. Goodly, good or bad, only I can be me. Only you can be you. And that's something that's a good thing. Behind every obstacle we face lies an opportunity. Paralysis by analysis and never taking the first step forward of our stop doing or our start doing list is not a plan. Decision by indecision, simply never deciding anything, going, oh, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm still thinking about it. That's not a strategy. In sales and marketing, we're in an intersection of the two worlds, of the two disciplines where marketing has to think of sales and sales is forced to think from a marketing perspective. We have to market ourselves as salespeople and communicators. And I'm not a marketer. Well, you've got to think like one. And marketers have to think like salespeople. And at this road is our brand in the future. So could have, should have, would have, that's great. That doesn't get the job done. I like to quote something I've heard a lot of times. If you want something bad enough, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll make an excuse. And funny enough, I had somebody tell me one time when I had a workout program, my fitness trainer guy, he was trying to get me in shape, fix a, an old uh, neck injury. He pulled up one of my blog posts and sent it to me because I kept not making it. He's like, you want it bad enough, you'll find a way. If you don't, you'll find an excuse. He said, I just thought you'd find this article interesting. It was from me. I'm like, I'll be there in 15 minutes. Begin each day as it was on purpose. Plan, work the plan, you know, plan your day out, work the plan, and the crisis are going to come like we looked at, but then don't lose track of the most pressing things. Put those last things last so that you can get to your first things first. There's three types of people in sales. There's those who make things happen, there's those who watch things happen, and there's those who wonder what happened. Hashtag, because we're in a hashtag hysteria world, as I blogged on recently, make it happen. I showed you earlier the stretch. I won't do it again. But there's a big difference in grow and, I mean, excuse me, goal-oriented or good. But once you achieve a goal, you want to grow and really, really push it out. That's my information. I have a second session this afternoon. Uh, you can see I do embrace, like you guys, all the social media channels. Uh, sometimes it comes overwhelming, but I enjoy them. And I'm glad to, I'll be here another session, I'll be around. So uh, that covers it. And thank you so much for your attention.